Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, new session of uh, cybersecurity for Linux. Um, I have uh, added uh, this uh, session at the demand of the student of the uh, engineering school uh, of uh, the NCBS in uh, Vannes in Brittany in France in the uh, cyber defense section. Um, and we're going to talk about how to encrypt and cipher data on a file system. So um, let's uh, try to start the uh, conference. Uh, it's always a little bit tricky when we have to do that. So we're going to change and uh, and uh, I hope that. Uh, that will do it and I'm going to double check that we have this. It seems that the uh, system is working so we're going to be able to uh, progress. So um, for those who didn't uh, follow the previous uh, sessions, uh, my name is Dominica Foll. I'm uh, an architect, software architect uh, at Intel uh, Open Source Technology and I also uh, give uh, Linux uh, cybersecurity uh, courses uh, at the University of Southern Brittany um, and at the NCBS which is an engineering school. One been located in Lorient and the second one been located in Vannes, both in, in Brittany. Um, so uh, let's have a look at uh, what we're going to talk about uh, today. So uh, very quickly we'll come back on the basic concept of uh, ciphering. Uh, not that um, I intend at all to uh, get uh, anything on on the cipher side. Okay, let's let be very clear. Uh, this is uh, not uh, my topic uh, and my domain of uh, expertise. So um, we will um, just have a look at uh, you know what are the basic principles and and what is up to date. If you want to uh, go back to cipher, there are plenty of uh, publications about uh, the latest uh, ciphering techniques. Uh, this is not really uh, what we will talk about. We will just use them. Now we will go by step. Uh, the first step will be to see how we can protect individual file or data set, in particular emails. Then we'll look at how to protect directories, which is a very common problem. A problem that people have to solve and it's a very practical way to actually also isolate data. And uh, then we'll go to a more traditional how to uh, encrypt a partition and disk. And finally we'll do uh, a quick look at what are the specific challenges uh, of booting from an encrypted disk um, with a different step. Uh, do you want to boot 100% of the disk and to encrypt 100% of the disk or do you have the options to only encrypt a part of it and we'll talk about the pros and cons. And finally, as usually, I will um, advise you some homework so you can actually uh, finalize and test your knowledge from this course. So, ciphering. Um, the first ciphering um, track in the history uh, is being given to the Arabs um, uh, around the um, 9th century and 800s time uh, where they did the substitutions and uh, the reason why we know that they were using it is probably because they published uh, what they did. There were before some technique with especially the ciphering buttons that was well known uh, which was just uh, a shift uh, system. Uh, here for the first time we started to have uh, really a concept of uh, describing describing uh, how to cipher and decipher messages uh, with a, a practical uh, methodology to try to make it very difficult. The um, 1800 started to really start the beginning of what is called today the crypt analysis uh, with uh, Charles Babbage. Um, we actually work on mathematical uh, cryptanalysis. That was really the beginning of the modern cryptography um, and especially um, created the uh, polyalphabetic uh, ciphering techniques. Um, more recently, uh, around 1940 with uh, World War II, uh, we really had uh, the birth of um, 
mathematical cryptography. Um, the Enigma from uh, the uh, made it her name very well known with uh, World War II, and uh, that was created by um, Arthur uh, Scherbius. Um, but it actually was based on a work done previously by a Dutch guy, Hugo Koch, uh, who patented uh, his concept uh, as early as 1919, so at the end of World War I. Uh, as you know, Turing and his uh, bunch of mathematicians in UK succeeded to crack it with what is considered to be the first uh, practical uh, computer working uh, on Earth. Um, and they did that uh, in a secret lab in, in Britain during World War II. More recently, uh, Shannon uh, created the theory of communication and theory. And, and that would really has created the concept that we're using today <coughs> uh, with uh, especially the uh, asymmetric ciphering uh, based on um, public and private keys. So what, what is the latest status? Um, we have today the advanced encryption standard and I would say that nobody else is really trying to be able to replace it uh, for practical use. It's quite old, uh, 1988. Uh, it, it was actually uh, created from three person, uh, Ringel, Serpent and Two Fish. And, and they did actually uh, a publication that enabled the concept or created the concept of public and private asymmetric encryptions and with different uh, size of key and ciphering mode. It's based on the specificity uh, of the prime numbers. And uh, if you want to know more, as I've said, go back to uh, a lot of publications which are available uh, in books and on the net. More recently, uh, with the coming exp or the expectation of coming soon uh, quantum computers, uh, people start to think that it will be possible to crack by brute force um, the AES uh, encryption, especially when the key size are not too big. But even with pretty large keys, um, when uh, you start to have the power of quantum computing, uh, you really shift the problem of brute force and, and you can start to do things that uh, are not possible with today technology, but likely going to be possible tomorrow. So people have started to look at that. Uh, and one of the things which is popping up today is um, elliptic uh, curve cryptography. Um, actually, the concept mathematically are quite old. 1985, but really the first usable elliptic curve uh, cryptography algorithm came in about 2005. Um, and, and the idea is that um, you create alphabet and you create, potentially you create errors and uh, you, you have to find out uh, by the knowledge of the initial alphabet what is the nearest uh, symbol that you could allocate to uh, the place when you decipher. So it, it's very difficult to um, get out of it without a huge amount of calculation if you don't have this uh, previous knowledge. Because when you decipher the system, it's not completely deciphered. You still have to do uh, quite a bit of, uh, of work to get to the right things. It, it's unfortunately today pretty slow when you implant, implement it. And uh, for that reason, um, it, it is not used everywhere. And to be honest, it doesn't need to be used everywhere. As I've said, quantum computing is not yet available. So you have to look really at selecting things which are in line with the risks that you are trying to defend from. And always remember that, except if you work in an area where you have uh, state class uh, potential hackers, you're likely going to have to deal with uh, cyber criminals. Um, and cyber criminals are interested by money, and which means that the cost of hacking the system has to be less than the value that they can get out of a hacked system. So it's always a, a fine balance between both. Um, so I've said most systems today use AES, and with a different size of key, a decent size of key, it's considered to be perfectly a viable solution. Now. And apparently of the ciphering techniques you have, you still have the mode of encryptions. And as you can see in that image, which has been used a lot, 
if you use the same algorithm to encode the same block, you're going to have the same result. And so if you have capability to have a lot of identical segment, you're going to be able to actually make a guess. And the guesstimate could be quite good on what is actually the data which has been encrypted. And that has been published a lot on the, on the internet, especially with this image of um, text being uh, encrypting using AES, but using block mode. Now, when we use block mode, we have to be a little bit careful. This is a block mode where every single pixel is considered as a block. And obviously, all the black are encrypted the same way, and all the white are encrypted the same way, which means that you can actually guess the final image. In real world, uh, let's be honest, uh, that image would be encoded in JPEGs, so actually the repeat block would be different, and secondly, you would encrypt after writing it on a disk, and uh, the position of that image on the disk, likely on the record inside the disk would be different and so the block encryption would likely still give a noise. But it is a potential problem that you need to know if you are encrypting blocks and the blocks are identical, the result of the ciphering will be the same, which in some cases can be a problem. Um, fortunately for us, in significantly less cases than what people uh, let believe by showing these images. Now, the main advantage of block ciphering mm -hmm. is that you can do parallel encryption because each block is treated independently from the previous one, which means you can do parallel encryption, parallel descriptions, and you can also do random access for read, which is very important when you are reading big files. Um, now, it is not semantically secure, as I've explained before. If you have the same pattern, you will find the same cipher, and, and that is a side effect of it which potentially can help people to crack your key. Now, there are alternatives to that, uh, but I want to see very clear, you know, one, they're very slow, and two, they're not yet perfect, and perfection doesn't really exist, which is probably the uh, XTS or tree code book made uh, with ciphertext standing. In, in a nutshell, what it does, it uses the result of the previous block to uh, add a change in the seed for this ciphering. So each block becomes dependent from the previous one, which means that every time you progress, you have a change in, in the seed, and so you probably shift a little bit the key, which means that the result is different. So even if you encrypt the same thing in two different blocks, the ciphered result will be different. Um, now, you can look at the theory. Um, now. Practicality is a big disadvantage of um, XTS is that you cannot really do parallel deciphering. You, you can potentially do some parallel encryption because you can encrypt a few blocks and you can seed not exactly the next one but you know a little bit further and so when you have your seed you can start to still use parallel system but for deciphering you cannot, you need to know what is what before and so the concept doesn't really work that well and when you do random read access you have to come back to the beginning um, of the chain in order to be able to decipher the block you are interested with uh, a little bit like when you uh, decode um, MPEG uh, video where you, you have to find the initial image before you can actually start to mm -hmm. apply the delta so very similar to that technique which means that obviously read access randomly is extremely unperforming. Now if you do sequential read that's less of a problem because obviously you use the data in, in a stream and so the concept of uh, parallel deciphering is less critical um, and you can potentially live with it but you have to be sure that you need it. So in reality, most of people are going to use block ciphering, and as I've said, block ciphering for most of the use is still a very valid technology. Now, you can use both, and uh, as you will see, both tools uh, that we'll talk about uh, are capable to use it, even if by default uh, they don't use the same solution. Now, that is for the general point. So, as I've said, 
In the real world of today, we're mostly going to use AIS and we're going to use block ciphering. That will be enough for most of us. Um, and there is a, a very good library which has been created uh, in open source, which is open PGP um, for pretty good privacy. Um, and uh, that has uh, a specifically capability to encrypt a single data set with a set of utilities which are available and which can use uh, asymmetric key to or symmetric key to actually uh, store uh, your encrypted data. The most common solution with PGP, uh, especially with this implementation in any mail, any mail which is the um, the de facto standard solution for uh, sending encrypted mail, um, very very nicely integrated uh, in Thunderbird. Uh, the uh, email tool from uh, Mozilla Foundation is actually you use um, an asymmetric key to store a random symmetric key and uh, this is very nice when you send email because it means that you can actually use a public key from the uh, remote destination and create a small safe in which you embed a random symmetric key so your ciphering process and deciphering is very quick um, and uh, you also have the capability to create a wallet where you put multiple keys. Um, why would you put multiple key to access to the symmetric key which is hidden? Uh, very practically first to be able to read the email you have sent back from your mailer because if you encrypt an email with the public key of your remote destination when you're going to look in your you know sent directory, that mail is going to be encrypted and you will not be able to read it because you don't have the private key corresponding to the public key you have used to encrypt it. So the Enigma mail, what it does, it creates a container with multiple keys um, and so uh, it will create multiple entry and it will fundamentally create entry which are protected by multiple keys and so it will also use your own public key which means that if you have your own private key, which is definitely advisable, uh, you will be able to read the email you have sent to someone else. It's also allowed to send the email to multiple correspondents without using a unique, a unique key. If you want to send an email to John and Paul, um, you're going to use a public key of John, the public key of Paul, and your own public key to create uh, a safe that will have multiple entrants. So Paul, John and you will be able to get into that email and read it. Um, and the ciphering will only be done once using that random symmetric key, uh, which is actually being stored in that uh, secure wallet. So it's a very nice solution. I definitely advise to have a look at open PGP and Enic Mail. Um, uh, it's simple, it's very good. You can decide which size of key you want to have and uh, uh, which type of ciphering technology, it's a very, very good tool. Um, there are some alternatives. Uh, one, not my preferred, but quite practical, especially for low-value document, is ZIP. Uh, why ZIP is interesting? Because it works multiple platforms. So if you send an, a document to someone who doesn't have an email and doesn't understand anything, and he has a PC or a Mac or a Linux box and you don't know what he has, you can ZIP it and you can actually encrypt with ZIP and uh, pass him the key by another medium. Um, so typically you send a file, you post it somewhere and you can send the key by whichever technique you want. Um, either directly talk to him or send uh, a small SMS on his phone, you know, probably a parallel channel. It's not 100% secure, parallel channel can be obviously uh, hacked, but nevertheless, it, for most of basic applications, this is far, far better than nothing. Uh, and OpenSSL provide as well capability to encrypt files um, uh, using fundamentally the same AIS tools and PGP does, but without all the sophistication of this uh, container with multiple entries and so on. So uh, I personally prefer uh, the PGP tools. Um, so that for encrypting individual files or emails. So that is typically used when you exchange data or you just want to hide uh, a unique um, set of data in one file on your own machines. A, a far more common need 
is to actually encrypt directories. Uh, no, it can go from the slash home or just from uh, a private, like personally what I have on my machine. You know, my machine is used a lot for doing compilation um, because I work on automotive grade Linux and you know, running Yocto on an encrypted disk slowed down quite a lot the process. So I don't want to do that, but on the other side I have a number of private uh, directories and so fundamentally I have a, a a bunch of data safe, not one, but a bunch of them, that are directories in which I have uh, protected information. Now there are two ways to do uh, encryption of directory. One is um, a file by file. Uh, so fundamentally what you do is that you have a directory and each files are encrypted in the directory and the directory is readable pretty normally. Um, there is a very good tool in Linux, which is uh, using the Fuse file system, which is encrypt file system. And um, it is a, a very practical and very nice solution uh, for numbers of reasons. The first one, it works without root access. So you can actually uh, force your uh, user to actually have a safe. For example, you could have a directory which is uh, uh, private with your uh, client contact or your uh, secret documentation without having to give the root access to your uh, user and, and that's very practical um, so that's that's very nice um, the second thing which is very nice with uh, the uh, EncryptFS uh, solution is that it does a file by file encryption um, and you can decide actually if the file name is also encrypted or not. Um, in general, it's a good idea to do it, but sometimes it, it can be a problem. Um, and, and the good thing of that is that probably create a, a, a hidden directory which is encrypted. And you can mount as a user that encrypted directory using Fuse file system, which is running in user mode, which is why you don't need root access to do the mount. And uh, you, you mount it uh, probably on, on any point on your system. And once it's mounted, you just work with the file as it was standard. Uh, the good thing is that the files are always encrypted. So it's not like with a zip or like with uh, PGP or OpenSSL where you, you send an encrypted file and when you receive, you decrypt it and then it's decrypted at, with, at the rece receive end. No, here the file is never decrypted. It's only accessible decrypted, but if you would go on the file system, you would see that it's actually encrypted. And uh, that's nice because the way NKFS works, it uses the, uh, the DAX, or the discretionary access system, to make that the file is only readable and writable by whoever has opened it. And you cannot share it with the user, so that's, that's very nice. Um, so you have the protection from the OS. Uh, to stop to protect it. Now the bad side is that as always with any mounting solution while the file is mounted um, any application running with the same user IDs and the user has opened the file will be able to read it. Um, this is where mandatory access control can come to help because mandatory access control could decide which application actually would be able to access that file. You could also use the extended ACL, but as I've said, they can be bypassed by the user, so uh, it, it is uh, not as good as mandatory access control. So I definitely encourage you to have a, a, a look at uh, Encrypt uh, File System. It is provided by default in most distribution. You just have to load the package and it will work out of the box. The alternative to encrypt a directory is actually to create a disk image and to mount it as a loop. Now, uh, there are automated or embedded way of doing it, especially uh, uh, there is a solution called Tomb, um, which is quite nicely done. To, what they do is fundamentally they encrypt uh, in a loop. Uh, a directory that is mounted, so it's a disk image, and uh, the management of the key is quite smartly done. 
So the keys are independent from the data, which is not the case in uh, EncryptFS, where economically the, the, the keys is resident in the same place than the data. Uh, but you have to know your passphrase. Uh, with, um, with Storm, actually, the key are independent. And so you can obviously leave them on the same machine and just have a passphrase, which is what most people do. But you can also hide the key in a JPEG or in a QRC code. And now, those of you who have been following my different courses know that I don't believe very much in protection by obfuscation. Hiding things has never helped a lot. But not a lot doesn't mean that it doesn't help at all. Now, you definitely should not rely on it, but it's not a bad way to pass a key in a hidden way without attracting attention. And uh, it also can be interesting if you want to protect data, not only for traditional deciphering, but for example, for mean snoop that you are sending data. So it is, uh, for example, for journalists in some specific countries where the um, freedom of uh, information is not guaranteed. It's, it's one way to hide the fact that you're actually sending uh, secret keys. Um, and, and so less chance to be picked up by automatic tools. But I, I would not 100% rely on that not being picked up. Automatic tool quite smart. Um, one point to remember when you encrypt a directory is that as I've said, the data are never written on disk in clear, but they are accessible in clear as long as the system is mounted. So it's very important to make solution where you mount and you unmount your secret data when you don't need them anymore. For example, on my private machine uh, that I travel uh, with, uh, I have a number of private documents which are practical, you know, because I'm asked regularly to have them, a copy of my passport, a social security card, a print of my driving mm -hmm. license, and you know, type of document, my bank account. And uh, I keep them in a private directory, and, and I have just a small script called OpenSafe and CloseSafe, um, and I use EncryptFS for that. And, and so as soon as I finish with it, I just close it. Now, EncryptFS also has a timeout option, which is quite handy. So you can define that if you didn't use any data in the EncryptFS directory for a number of minutes, it will close it automatically for you, which is very, very nice. Uh, I don't know if Tom has the equivalent, maybe. Uh, I know the tool a bit less because I don't use it personally. But that are two tools. There are different alternatives, and, and what we're going to see later to encrypt uh, full disk and partition could also be used to encrypt directory um, by creating uh, loop disk images. Um, I, I just don't consider that as a standard good practice because uh, it's just too heavy and the management of the keys are a bit of a nightmare. So I, I, I tend to advise to stick with tools which are designed to encrypt directory because Obviously, they use roughly the same concept, but the management of the keys and the way the utilities are done are more adequately, uh, more adequate to use for encrypting uh, directories. Now, the next step is if you want to encrypt the full partition. Ah, that's a very interesting point. So, in, in Linux, the standard definition is Lux. Okay. Um, you have VeraCrypt as well, which is cross-platform, started on Windows, uh, works for Macs and Linux, which is also available, but the default is Lux. Both can work. Uh, the idea is, is always the same. You're going to mount a disk image. Um, and modern cipher algorithms are supported in both cases. Um, a new option keeps showing up, you know, bigger keys, different algorithm, uh, uh, a little bit of improvement in key management. Uh, so fundamentally, it's very difficult to say which one is better than the other. Fundamentally, they both can do the same. They just tend to, by default, not to do the same thing, and they tend to be better optimized at certain type of use. Uh, but new options being coming up all the time, you know, they, they tend to follow each other. The real difference in the way they manage their keys. That really was a big difference. Um, and um, 
the point is that Linux file system is extremely flexible. And especially Linux is very good at allowing capability to hide extra headers in headers and in headers, which means that you can pile up system uh, very transparently. The challenge with that is if you get outside of Linux world, that's not true anymore. Uh, especially with Windows and even with boot process, especially if you have multiple boot. So that, that's a bit of the challenge. Um, and we'll come back to that. But uh, as long as you're in Linux, quite often the piling up is the easy solution. Um, and on my case, I only work on Linux, so the rest is a non problem for me. But as I've said, most of Windows solutions are using VeraCrypt. Um, remember that whatever the solution to credential will be required at one time. Now, by credential, we may require the real key to access the data. We may require just a key to access to a wallet where the key is actually, the actual key is hidden. That's a solution for Lux. Or we could just require a passphrase because the key is fundamentally uh, available already. But you know, you, you have different solutions. And we'll come a little bit more in detail on that way of working, especially with Lux, as I've said, which is the one advice all by default used in Linux. So the Linux unified key setup. The, the principle of Lux is very simple. What you do with that, you create like a wallet at the beginning of your partition in which you add slots for keys. And actually you add eight key slots. And uh, these key slots are going to give you access to the real key. Now the interesting point is that this key slot can be with different keys. And people can wonder why would you like to have multiple keys. So you're going to use asymmetric encryption if you want. You have a different way of protecting it, but there is Lux is pretty smart in the way it protects its key. And uh, you can have a key, for example, for the normal guy, the guy who is doing the boot. But you can still have a key for the admin. So the admin could boot even if the original guy has lost his data. Or you can have a key for the backup, um, which is there. And um, when you do the backup, you don't use the key. Now, in one way, having two keys is to have two, two chains to be hacked because, especially with social engineering, you potentially have more options to find someone who has access to the encrypted data. Yes, that's correct. But it also allows you to um, be a little bit um, more strict on the way you use your key. And, and very interestingly, the key you use for accessing the encrypted data is actually not in the slot. That one is randomly calculated. It's a symmetric key to allow very fast encryption on the disk. Which means that if, for example, your admin is leaving you, one of the great solutions is that you can remove his key directly. You know, you can just get it out. So as soon as you are, and you don't have to re-encrypt your disk. You, you just change that slot. And uh, because you, you have the capability to connect from another point, you can actually do so. So that's a very, very sophisticated solution. Pass a header, uh, fundamentally you use dmcrypt. Okay, dmcrypt is a low-level uh, solution from, from Linux. Um, now you could use dmcrypt directly, but then you would have to manage your key by yourself. So Lux, in, in one way, is a DM query with a set of tools to manage your keys. And so the, the way of using it is, is very simple. We're going to pile up logical volumes. Uh, so you start by doing a Lux format. And Lux format, what it creates, it will create a Lux volume. And it will ask you for one passphrase, which will be the passphrase to access to the key slot one by default. Now, when you have that, you have still not created any data. 
Now you're going to create a lux open, which is actually going to create a logical entry in the dev mapper, which is probably a logical volume mapper on Linux. And here you are going to have a device. And in that device, you can actually make a file system, which is encrypted. Okay? And then you can mount it. Now you have lux add key to add optional keys into the uh, keys wallet and you're going to decide on which key slot you want to add that key. So what we see here is that it's a standard dmcrypt solution which is using AIS uh, by default. Now you can use XTS if you want as an alternative but as I've said be sure that you actually need it because it's going to be very slow. Um, and uh, you have the capability to add multiple keys, uh, to define a proper backup strategy and uh, also uh, a safe strategy with one uh, key slot, uh, keys or passphrase being lost. For example, when people are ill or resigning very quickly and uh, not always very hopeful. Um, now, the more key you create, the more you have to manage secrets. The main disadvantage of Lux is that actually the encrypted key is actually in that wallet. And so if you succeed to crack that wallet, you have access to the encrypted data. That's the reality. So the tractor of Lux says that the, the, the hidden data, the real encryptions key uh, for the rest of the data, is located in a pretty well identified place uh, and so it is possible definitely not easy but possible in Siri at least to crack it by brute force and get the key once again it depends what you have to protect and how much you have to protect uh, but definitely that is the, the weakness and the strength of Lux the key are actually manage in a proper way as part of the partition. Now because we are on Linux, um, I've said that after you done your device by Lux Open, you can format it, but in reality in Device Mapper you have a logical volume and nothing stops you to pile a logical volume using LVM in that mapper. Uh, so that's very feasible. Uh, we'll come back on different option to pile up uh, different uh, logical volume a little bit later but obviously you should remember that piling up on top of Lux logical volumes is very easy. Now the alternative to Lux is, is VeraCrypt. VeraCrypt has replaced TrueCrypt. Um, it's coming from Windows so the command line interface is very poor uh, which is a pain when you have a server to manage remotely by SSL. It's designed to be managed by a UI, you know, it's a very window, it's click and click and click, which is good and bad. In my world, working on embedded system and on servers, in general, it's bad. But depending on what you do, it can be good. Uh, the good thing is that it's cross-platform. Now, the bad thing is that if you want to share the same device, remember that cross-platform, it's only FAT and NTFS because in reality, it's actually to be honest, fat, because Mac are not very good at writing NTFS files, they can, but they're not very good. Um, and uh, fat file system is definitely used by everyone. Um, but that is a limit. Now, quite often cross-platform doesn't mean you want to share the same physical disk on different platform. Uh, but that you rather want to have the same tool and the same management technique, and then you are not forced to restrict yourself to FAT and NTFS, you definitely can use other file system, mm -hmm. um, especially on Linux and on Mac. Um, it offers a concept of hidden volume, which is a very specific need for people having to hide data from investigation. And they have a concept of non-repudiation, which means that you, you cannot prove that a data is hidden in the file system. It's really designed for um, people having to protect the fact that they were owning data. 
for good or for bad reason okay i hope it's mostly used for the good one but as all these tools it can be used in both ways now there's still a command line interface uh, so well equipped uh, with the option minus t minus c will create a volume and uh, that volume uh, you're going to decide where you want to mount it so that volume is a file and that file is going to be mounted you see here that uh, the volume is created as a file um, which means that it's not a logical device it's not in a mapper which means that you're not going to be able to easily add multiple volume inside a Vera crypt a facility um, but nevertheless it's not been designed for that um, but you can use Vera crypt in Lux container on Linux that's possible okay it's not the default mode of operation, but you can. Um, i never done it, to be honest. Uh, but the option is there if you want to play with that, which could be interesting if you want to, fundamentally if you want to create hi hidden volumes. You know, if you have a need for creating hidden volume, uh, you are going in a country where potentially your, your disk could be taken by uh, the authority and you definitely don't want to get them to be able to prove that some data are there um, it would make sense um, but as I've said uh, the interesting point of VeraCrypt is that the credentials are not stored on the data which means that even whatever brute force you apply you're not going to find it because it's outside now depending where you've put it outside you know if it's in the USB stick which is with you they're going to find it very easily um, on Luxy credential is inside the Lex container and protected by different uh, keys uh, especially on key slot so if you use VeraCrypt inside the Lex container you still have the management of the key done by Lex if we compare both um, the compatibility of Lex is specifically Linux uh, VeraCrypt as I've said is cross-platform um, you can create new sub-volume with Lux very easily. I would not say it's impossible with VeraCrypt, but definitely is outside of the standard way of operation. And on top of that, it would only work on Linux, potentially on Mac, uh, but definitely not on Windows. So it's not a general way of working. You can open and modify the existing volume. That's no problem. You can encrypt an entire partition on an entire disk. Yes. Uh, you can create encrypted file containers. Uh, it's easier with VeraCrypt because VeraCrypt for them to create a file. So that file can be put wherever you want while Lux create a logical volume. Uh, and that logical volume doesn't exist, so it's very difficult to send it somewhere else. It's a logical volume. It's a virtual view of Linux. Um, not that it is impossible, but as I said, it's complicated. Uh, the, the plausible deniability definitely is not something that Lex has. There is no mechanism by default to create a hidden uh, set of data inside Lex, while with VeraCrypt is actually part of the initial system. As I've said, you can use VeraCrypt inside Lex, which is, if you have only that requirement, potentially a very uh, good solution. Um, and the ease of use. Um, Lux is integrated extremely well in Linux, so it's very easy to use. Uh, VeraCrypt is being created on Windows, which had no concept for doing that type of ciphering, and so it's been designed to be added on top of a system that didn't know about it. So obviously, it's more complicated. Um, and the speed is faster. And the speed is faster fundamentally because by default, VeraCrypt uses XTT. So um, it doesn't use block cipher, while by default, Lux does now you can change this default and then the faster and slower will move as well um, one point to be very careful with VeraCrypt when they say that it's easy to uh, create um, file containers yes it's easy to create them but because by default you use XTT uh, and not block ciphering and it's not crypting file as soon as you're going to change one thing on one file you may have to encrypt a lot of things which means that on the remote end you're going to have to change a lot of things so the efficiency 
of the file container created by Veracrypt is going to be low, which is part of speed is slow. Uh, if you are capable to survive with file container with uh, encrypt file system, I would definitely go for encrypt file system because that would be very fast on, on containers because it only modify uh, the file that you have touched and uh, you have different options you can even allow to depending on the blocking system you've used you know plenty of options in encrypt file system but it will definitely be quicker whatever it is and if you look at the option very carefully you can even make it very quick um, with very quick file container is possible but it will always be slow so that uh, the situation of both solution now we have seen how to encrypt uh, data in general uh, file directory partition now the real world is how do I boot a system with an encrypted disk so the tradition is what is shown on that graphic the boot is not encrypted the slash is quite often not encrypted but maybe but the idea is that boot and slash is your general operating system, so why bother to encrypt them? While home contains the critical data, and that one is encrypted. I tend to disagree with that general value because in reality, the fact that you encrypt also provides an integrity check. If you don't encrypt your data, they can be changed. So anyone can change your uh, slash file system has the capability to add facilities inside that will uh, potentially sif siphon your data and and you know snort your data that are available and encrypted when the file system is mounted. Remember what I've said, uh, even if you have an encrypted file system, when the file is mounted, the data are actually visible in clear. So if you don't protect slash boot and slash, you have the capability to add solutions inside the system that will actually siphon the data while the home will be mounted. Now, depending on the risk you're facing, that may not be valuable, that may be valuable, your call. Um, obviously, ciphering only home is very easy. You use dmcrypt or you use better lux and it's a done deal you know that uh, what is offered by a lot of uh, distribution today uh, they create uh, a numbers of uh, container using lux for every user and every user has his own home which is encrypted so when you log uh, as part of the password uh, pam has a capability to pass the information and this is used to actually uh, allow your password of the user is used for login at the same time that it is used to enable the deciphering of the home directory of the user. It's a very good solution because it's very transparent, users are using it and um, it, it is uh, pretty good. Um, on top of that, if uh, you have used Lux directly on a physical partition, not on a logical volume like it is shown on that graphic, but on a physical partition, then when you go in sleep mode and in hibernation uh, Lux is very smart, it will actually disconnect and remove uh, every access to the uh, data, non-encrypted. But um, unfortunately if you have um, done it the other way, so you have uh, built on LVM, that's different because then the LVM is going to keep the status and, and you have access to it. So there is a bit of a tricky say, but most of usage you could say that if crypting home is enough, that's good for you, but remember that you could still access uh, to your data by modifying uh, either the kernel in slash boot or the init rd and uh, slash uh, which is containing the entire file system. Now you can do it the other way. So. As I've said, we can pile things on things, and logical volume can be piled on logical volume. So the logical volume we're talking here are mostly lux. 
and LVM, the logical volume manager. So, the easy way is to create directly locks on a partition. It's very easy to start, it's a bit more difficult to maintain because as you've created locks directly on physical partition, if you lack of space or you want to create a way, then you cannot. Right? You're on physical partition. Now you can do an LVM on top of LUX. The main advantage of that solution is that you only need one credential for all the logical volume. So you create LUX on, uh, on your whole entire disk. And LUX is, is not capable to, to join multiple disks. That's the job of LVM, but you create it on the entire disk. And you have one credential, and in that credential with LVM, you create logical volumes. And these logical volumes are going to have your slash boot, your slash, your home, and everything. So the main value is that when you boot, you only have one request for one password, and the entire system is decrypted. Now, if you do that, you also have to remember that it's really at boot time that you provide the deciphering solution that every user has the same deciphering solution. Uh, but now you can also use inside uh, your Lux volume potentially EncryptFS to protect data if they are very specific to given users. But then you encrypt encrypt it, so slow. And the other way is to do Lux on LVM. Um, in one way this is better because your volume when you go in lock, um, so it's, um, sorry, it's easier. Uh, that's what is shown here. So the graphic shows that we have LVM, and LVM is used to take physical disk and create virtual partition, and this virtual partition, one of them is managed with LUX. Um, but unfortunately, um, it has a few disadvantages. The first one is that you're going to, def to need multiple passwords one for each encrypted lux. So at boot time you're going to have to enter it twice. Um, the, the second point is that when you are in hibernation the volume will remain clear. So because LVM is actually going to keep the status uh, when you go in hibernation and not lux by your position or the other way. If lux is the lowest low volume when lux go in hibernation it will actually remove the key. So there are pros and cons on both solutions. Um, as I've said in my previous lesson, in any case, if you want to make a safe system, allowing hibernation is a no-no. Uh, sleep potentially is okay, even if you can potentially hack a system and asleep, but that requires a very serious knowledge of hardware and not for everyone. It's for a lot of application, it's a manageable risk. Uh, hibernation is not, because you get plenty of time, everything is on hard drive. And uh, I would also deactivate swap. So remember, no swap, no hibernation. If you encrypt the system, that two mode that you definitely want to deactivate at kernel level, so it's never going to happen. Now the, the last point is really, how can you encrypt your slash boot? Because that is where is your init RD, and th that's a bit difficult. Um, so your directory slash boot typically contain your kernel and your init RD, and as you remember, the init RD is uh, a mini uh, slash file system that you have and allow to push your uh, to, to build your system before you remount the complete sub system. So uh, if you use Grub. Grub2 has two modules for crypto disk and LUX, so it's absolutely capable to manage that directly. It's also cap capable to manage LVM. And you can add those modules to your Grub2 configuration, and in your initRD you have to add the tool for managing uh, the LVM and encrypt. So that's the first. You obviously need that because Grub will have to uh, load uh, the init RD and uh, the kernel, and if that is in an encrypted partition, you're going to need that one. Um, now the challenge is that you're still going to have to create that. So the, the 
the easiest way is to create uh, a single Lux container on your entire disk. And I've said this is the safer solution in any case when you go to sleep and, and hibernation mode. And, and to add the key, a key to the Lux container. Now you can copy that key in the initRD. Now the initRD is itself encrypted. Mm -hmm. So it's not really readable by, it's not going to be read by anyone else than Grub. And because Grub has a capability to manage crypto disk, when Grub boot, you can give the pass key to Grub. Grub will decipher the initRD and the kernel and boot it. If you have not done anything special, when initRD is going to start to mount, to remount slash, it's going to request the key once again, which is really annoying, which is why you can actually pass that key in the initRD. So it requires a little bit of um, a complex building, but it's very feasible. And, and once you finish, you can unmount slash boot, and then initRD is not going to be readable by anyone, because if you unmount it, it's not anymore available. And if you try to remount it, you will be requested to have the key. So you have to get the knowledge of the key. So it's not a bad way to do that. And in the details of that slide, I have given a link which explain uh, how to do that in detail. It's definitely an interesting exercise. Uh, but that's the only way if you want to enter the passphrase only once. Alternative is to enter twice, which is what happened on my Mac. You know, when I boot my Mac, I have to enter my credential twice wants to boot the system and wants to log in. Okay, it's annoying, but it's also not a killer. Uh, that's that one way. Now the path phrase requested once. Uh, this path phrase can also be set up on a USB drive. So that's uh, a specificity of uh, the um, system. You can, especially in Grub, you can say where the path phrase is located and even where the key. But as I've said, in, in if, that, if you use dmcrypt directly, the key could be there on the, and then not have the key. If you use lex, it's only the passphrase to access to one of the slots. And, and what you can do is to have a passphrase which is different, which is not known from your admin. So if your admin has to mount the disk manually, he may have his own passphrase as well. So that's how you have to do it if you want to encrypt uh, slash boot. To be honest, it's a bit complex and it's not done very often. In reality, it's not that complex and uh, it definitely adds a huge security because it stops potential hacker to modify your kernel and slash boot and your init RD. So it stops people to come at a very low level because otherwise it's a very easy place to access. Um, and to modify the solution because you can add facilities that will be very difficult to detect uh, because it happened at boot time and for that I will remember if you have not already looked at it or you forgot it to take back uh, lesson one which is around the boot that I created which explain what can happen around the boot and, and why any hacking dot at very low level is extremely extremely dangerous and difficult to detect so encrypting the boot is valuable for that reason. The opposite of encrypted the boot is how to encrypt networking disk. Now, you can cipher the disk with all the technique we've seen before, but once the disk is mounted, it's going to be in clear access, which means that every remote access are going to be done in the clear. And they're going to be transported in clear. So that's a very important point to remember. Even if your disk is encrypted, if you remotely access that disk, the disk data are going to be transported over the network in clear. There are not that many methods to actually go around that issue. The first one is to do a remote mount of encrypted containers. So we talked about uh, file containers. Um, easy to create with um, VeriCrypt or with um, and CryptoFS, um, the challenge is that, yes, you do a remote mount, but that means there is only one rewrite, read-write mount. You can do multiple mount, but you can only do one read-write. Um, and, and potentially the performance could be challenging, but that, that's a very efficient way. If, especially if you only need read data, it's a very efficient way to do it. You actually 
create uh, an encrypted container and you remote mount it. Then all the data access uh, encrypted. Uh, it's very easy to do with EncryptFS. Um, the other way is actually to use uh, SSH FS. So um, that's a file system mount to SSH. Uh, the main advantage is that it does not require root privilege. Uh, all the connection keys are managed to SSH, and you can use keys, you can use all the PKI and all the ID management. It's very nicely done in SSH. Um, all certificate, which made that, uh, you know, getting in the middle is also difficult. You know, it's, it's a good solution. Um, and the data are actually transported and encrypted, independently if actually the data on the disk is encrypted or not. In that case, it's just the networking which is encrypted. Uh, you can do multiple mount, that's definitely possible. Um, obviously you have the traditional lock, the same file cannot be accessed uh, multiple times uh, in read-write. But, you know, beside of that, you can have multiple mount possible in the same directory. Uh, it's a bit slow, but it is a solution that is very efficient and that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, in particular, if you want to do remote backup, it's not a bad solution. There are other ways uh, to do remote backup, but it's not a bad way to actually transmit the data encrypted. Uh, it's not used very often because people forget about it, but it's, it's a good solution. There are not that many other ways, unfortunately, to get access to uh, remotely uh, encrypted disk without having the data transferred in clear. Now, there are a few things you need to remember. You're going to be on yourself when you encrypt the disk, okay? If you lost the key, you lost the data. That's a done deal. You're not going to get it out. Now, systems like Lux, which have multiple key slots, allow you to potentially have a backup. Um, but you will see that distributing your keys and storing your key is going to be very difficult. So you have to get a known solution. Don't try to invent yours. You're going to have a lot of problem and, and you can have a very good ciphering solution and probably mess it up by not having a proper management of your key. And it, it's a lot more difficult to manage the key correctly because it's a living solution than actually to manage the ciphering where you know, probably it's just mass and and brute force I is on theory very possible, but if you have taken a decent algorithm with different decent uh, size for the key, it's going to be very challenging to do it on brute force. But nicking your keys are more likely. Um, and so you have to really test all the scenario. You know, are your user capable to use them? How do you use them? You have to validate your backup strategy. And be careful not to add backdoors. It's a pretty uh, common solution. Now I come back to one point that I've said several times, which is very, very important. Encrypted file system, encrypted directory are going to be visible in clear while they are mounted. If you don't want your data to be visible in clear at any time, you have to encrypt them at application level. Which means that your application has to know the key, which potentially can be an issue, but you can ask the key to the user when it starts the application. Or you can use, you know, solution like PAM or a key wallet to get access to the key. The key wallet is a good solution in general. But it is the only way to have the data always encrypted. So there is no miracle on that. Okay. If you don't want to change your application, or you cannot change it, that's okay. But encrypting the file system will not stop people to access the data while the file system is mounted. And if you are mounted very often, you will have to re-enter your credential. Now, once again, key wallet uh, are a very good solution to avoid to re-add the user to, to ask the user every five minutes to retype his password. That will annoy him very quickly and likely 
it will stop to do it or we'll make a macro or give it to everyone you know put a sticker on his laptop with a password written on it uh, a lot of solution you don't want to have um, it's also not a bad solution to use key wallet because the key wallet like in Lux allowed to access to the key but actually that's not the key so it's very easy to you know remove access to some people you just have to remove the access to the wallet and and then it's a done solution so that that one thing that definitely worth to look at very carefully and we arrive to the end of this uh, lesson uh, I definitely would advise you to install Install Enigmail on your uh, Thunderbird and to create um, a public key and a private key and to put it in a public repo and exchange a few encrypted email. You can sign your email. Um, it, it is something that is worth to do. It's also allowed to sign and to encrypt with the same solution. Uh, very easy to use. Um, obviously, when you do that, uh, Google doesn't like that. So if you use Webmail, uh, Thunderbird is capable to access webmail of Google through IMAP. You have to enable IMAP in your uh, user settings, that's not difficult. But Google Mail doesn't make any easy for you to do it. Quite obvious. One, you have encrypted your email, they cannot do anything with them and they do their living out of understanding what you like, what you want, what you do. Uh, but if you have a client, uh, Thunderbird and some others, but I use Thunderbird personally, uh, Enigmail is, is extremely well integrated, uh, very easy to use and, and a very powerful solution. I would also um, advise to install uh, AnchFS um, and create a, a local data safe, um, create your uh, remote data safe as well. You can store that, for example, with AnchFS. You can put it very easily on, uh, on a Dropbox or you know any solution of that type and then it's encrypted at the end so uh, nobody can get access to it it's a very easy way to do um, and uh, with Lux you can cipher your home that's easy to do uh, you can cipher your temp and your swap uh, now remember that I've said several times swap for me should not exist on a solution which is secure so there is no reason to get swap a uh, machine which starts to swap is so slow that nobody will use it anyhow and the only interesting point is to manage uncontrollable uh, memory leaks um, which is a bad solution as well so removing swap is a good idea but you can cipher your TAMP that's not bad it's a complementary now if your TAMP is in in RAM with a TAMP FS uses with systemd um, and you don't allow people to go in hibernation then it doesn't make much value to do it because as I've said what TAMP is mounted it is accessible and clear and when it is unmounted uh, it's not visible but if you have it in RAMFS when it is unmounted it is destroyed so it's even better and, and look at try to define a test scripted, uh, scripted backup strategy how you would backup your scripted data without backing them encrypt you know unclear you want definitely to back up in encrypted so it's not that easy uh, to do it because typically if you have a partition uh, the challenge with the partition is that uh, when you you know read the partition mounted with a tar for example you are making it unclear so you have to think about how you're going to do that and, and you want to get your data uh, cipher. Now you can use a, a, a stream cipher with PGP, for example, to cipher your your tar as a pipe, and uh, make sure that you never have to get to uncipher the entire archive before you decipher it. So uh, tar has a capability to pipe things, which are very powerful, uh, and so you can pretty easily uh, do a tar of a partition. Uh, encrypt it on the fly from the uh, standard input to standard output and then transport it using SSH to a remote location um, and, and that's not bad if now for any reason you don't have enough power at the place where you read your original data you can use SSH to transport it's encrypted while transport because SSH will encrypt it and 
then you receive them decrypted and you can encrypt them at the end before you store them um, on on the archive uh, solutions that you have selected but you have to think about how to do it and we'll look at how do I encrypt who has a key who needs to have the key and uh, and you know how can I get back to the data and and so on and, and you will find out that it's not so easy now Lex has some tools to do that uh, uh, very nicely uh, Lex has tool to dump the key so you can store the key store somewhere else you know you look at the options there are quite a few facilities there uh, definitely worth to think very carefully about it with this uh, I wish you uh, to have a lot of fun with the entire system and uh, I'm sure that uh, we will have options to work together later uh, once again. Now I'm trying to get the end again to my solution to stop this recording and uh, 